Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Wake Up Missoula. I'm your host, Scott Ramp, here to usher you into the uh, basically the last Friday in January. It is the 26th of January, 2024. There's a lot of news, a lot of stuff happening, and I have a lot of city councils to get, jump right into. So on Monday, 15 items were approved Monday, which included collective bargaining, bargaining agreements with public employees and city engineers for wastewater, various projects from water mains and basic infrastructure projects, Clark Fork River Access and Restoration CIP projects, which I did spoke, uh, speak about a couple weeks back in length. Uh, Dean Stabone Mountain for forest consultant work on access and more regarding this. Uh, these are pretty much the regular kind of workings that the city always does besides the Clark Fork restoration project, which is ongoing. And I also have it in part of the climate conservation parks, which they talk a little bit further about this as it is an ongoing um, uh, project that the city is working towards for uh, construction this spring and hopefully have it ready by the summer. So kicking off for public comment is David Gray talking about the BIPOC population in Missoula. Um, I appreciate the work the council has done on the JEDI and equity and housing uh, studies in Missoula. I especially appreciate that all neighborhoods are supposed to participate in providing more density. I happen to live in the Franklin to the Fort neighborhood, which is the most diverse neighborhood and the only neighborhood with BIPOC communities in it. And I think that opportunity needs to be spread through all neighborhoods in Missoula. And the density needs to be spread through all neighborhoods in Missoula. We are one of the densest neighborhoods in town with the predominance of multifamily. And I think other neighborhoods need to share in that responsibility. Thank you. Okay. And so this is kind of a reflection on, you know, the city's efforts to uh, look at equity uh, by using some of the money that was provided through JEDI programs aimed at diversity and Missoula aimed at understanding the economic uh, division and diversity of neighborhoods and what is lacking in services and mostly used federal dollars for data collection. Uh, David Everyham brings the Fort Missoula Hospital up again as another meeting to decide whether or not this uh, site should be used for private um, and residential use on the Fort site. So this is uh, David Everyham. All of the water mains at the Fort area are very old and made of cast iron. This is one foot away from the old post. These pipe joints were typically lead packed and designed, designed to last 50 to 100 years. Leaky sewers, leaky water mains lead to contamination. The water at the Fort needs to be rigorous, rigorously tested by city and county health departments before anyone gets sick or gets lead poisoning. There are two old sewer mains running through the old post private property that would be under Max Wolf's proposed condos along with a four inch water main. There's not enough water at, this, at that point for fire mitigation. The hydrogen sulfide or, odor by the old post from a manhole is awful. Fort Missoula needs to be demolished and all the infrastructure decommissioned. This city and county needs to put the transmission in reverse and start taking care of what we already have and not going into overdrive and supplying thousands of houses for people who don't even live here and haven't paid into the system for 40 years like me. The old post hospital is 110 years old, has not been maintained for 50 years. In my opinion, it's a very ugly building and it shouldn't be rebuilt. Thanks. Thank you for your comments. Okay. And so, you know, this has been kind of an ongoing thing here in the city of Missoula as well with the, with the uh, potential for development in Fort Missoula while the historic preservation has indeed um, basically uh, voted against a resolution for this uh, remodel for the old um, uh, hospital and there's a lot of speculation including some of the people that work at the Fort Missoula grounds that the site is uh, weird that it is a private property in the first place surrounded by a bunch of property which is um, either uh, Historic Museum of Fort Missoula the uh, Museum of uh, Military History. Uh, I, sorry if I botched the name, I'm kind of reading off the top of my head right now. And you know, just a whole section of area which used to be an old military fort before it was decommissioned long, long ago. So it's, it's definitely very interesting about all that kind of stuff. But you know, people have spoken many things about this development um, all, and you know, this is just one of the things that's kind of ongoing. And it does, it will take city approval for this uh, project to move forward. And so far it's kind of been in limbo for some time now, but it hasn't been completely taken off the table. So uh, Sue uh, Kretschmeyer spoke for Montanans uh, move to amend 
um, there with the uh, uh, to react to a proclamation that the city of Missoula read for We the People Day, and this one is particularly aimed at corporations that would infuse uh, dark money and. Uh, the whole point of We the People is that corporations are not people and uh, they should not be treated as, uh, as such in terms of their voice in the moving forward. So this is uh, what she had to say with a group that was standing right behind her. We're here from many parts of the community and as I said, I'm here from Sue Kirchmar from Montana's Move to Amend. Many who are here and yourselves, you guys can sit if you want. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty forceful, okay. Um, Many he people who are here and there um, can remember how immediately obvious it was that we needed a constitutional amendment to put the U.S. Supreme Court's reasoning back on track after the 2010 Citizens United decision. Indeed, there was a groundswell of indignation in Missoula and across the state for how carelessly the court dismissed the, how crucial our 100 years of success in limiting money and corporations in our elections and protecting our level playing field was then and continued to be. My own immediate feelings at the time are fresh in my mind of being trapped, of feeling checkmated, uh, that there was no way forward if we played by the Supreme Court's new rules. Of course, over the last 14 years, those rules have impacted and stressed our communities because of the money and power that drowns out our voices from reaching our lawmakers. In contrast, when our community takes the time for this proclamation every year, it reminds us how lucky we are to live in a community that commits to a level playing field, not just in our elections, but in our whole community. Okay, and the point of uh, a lot of that had to do with the fact that um, uh, since the 2010 decision, a lot of outside uh, resources can be poured into the state of Montana for the purpose of uh, political ads, all that kind of stuff without any kind of limit or restriction. Uh, it's basically a pay to play in terms of our politics in the state of Montana for those higher seats, which either include our uh, two congressional seats or our two senatorial seats moving forward. So that's been an interesting kind of thing moving forward. Uh, one of the uh, dissenters of this particular proclamation was um, <coughs> uh, Sandra Versica, who doesn't necessarily believe that we should uh, censor uh, corporations. It would be ill-informed for someone to put their whole name and family name on the line when making an outcry if they're against the establishment. So that being said, um, I rarely find myself in agreement with the ACLU, ACLU, but I'm going to quote these words from their website because I agree with them on this matter. Quote, any rule that requires the government to determine what political speech is legitimate and how much political speech is appropriate is difficult to reconcile with the First Amendment. Our system of free expression is built on the premise that the people get to decide what speech they want to hear. It is not the role of the government to make that decision for them, end quote. And I guess uh, to put things, because I could go on and on about this, uh, but the ACLU and I, uh, I guess, see eye to eye on this one, and we uh, are both not in support of this proclamation. And I know this is not a voting matter, and I'm really happy that everyone came down to voice their opinions, because that is what um, democracy is for. So um, thank you all for coming down. I just wanted to politely disagree with this proclamation. Thank you. Okay. And so that's what she had to say about that. We're going to move on to the next thing, which had a lot more to do with the building fees. So this is something I talked about about two weeks ago. They were talking a little bit about raising the fee based on inflation for costs of um, getting permits for uh, construction and developmental projects here in the city of Missoula. Um, Walter Basinger from Developmental Services for the city explains uh, the reasoning behind uh, building the fee schedule. Building fund, as Kirsten has mentioned, has taken on an annual expenditures related to the management of the operations of the Acela software system. This expense was previously carried by the city's general fund, and it has now been rolled over as of last year to the building fund. Uh, this includes the annual licenses and the annual operation and maintenance, maintenance fees that are expected to increase by contract at 3% per year over the next five years until the contract is uh, up for negotiation and renewed again. Okay, 
And so that was basically just the, uh, the basic informational stuff about the, how they're moving forward with this. And frankly, not having to pull from general fund is always better a move since uh, permitting fees should be covered by developers as the city can work better with that model. Uh, Gene Mosted from Mosted Construction spoke against these uh, raises and he spoke last time about the, uh, how everything else is getting expensive and there's just, just another uh, nail in this uh, particular um, effort. I, I'm here to talk not so much about the fee but about the process of the building department uh, in getting uh, permits. Um, I don't agree with their, their evaluation that six to eight weeks is uh, an acceptable um, time frame for permits. Um, you're, um, they're looking back in five years. There was uh, years ago we were just as busy as we are now and we used to get them in two weeks. So I did a little research on that. And if you go to the, the Billings um, um, website and look up under fees, they have a thing. A, a, a question and answer thing in there and it ask, you can ask a, how long does it take to get a billing permit fee and in, in billings they state in, on their website that you can get a permit in four to seven days okay and also if you uh, we, 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 when we look further into it as well uh, the city uh, uh, rebuked by saying that um, uh, other communities across the state are paying somewhat between 15 to 30 percent more on permitting fees for some of these places and so we actually had somebody um, who gave comment uh, w that came with Gene. Uh, this is Brad McCall for Build Better and new Missoula resident talks about the process uh, with working with Missoula aside from working with Billings in which where he worked beforehand. The only permit I pulled here in Missoula was for a personal home for me a remodel and it took about six months and um, there was a lot of, you know, um, there was some corrections that needed to be done. There was a setback issue that um, I didn't understand, but that was kind of a big deal. I was kind of blown away and I was going, well, maybe it's just this one time, but even six to eight weeks is a big deal um, in time frames. Uh, when we're trying to bring, you know, more affordable housing, uh, this is a critical issue. So I, I think really honestly, the assessment of what the fee needs to be is, and if, if Billings is 30% more, that's fine. That works in our budget. Um, but what doesn't work is, you know, weeks and months. Um, because, you know, if you're trying to decide what the market needs, um, you know, another three months or, you know, six months doesn't work. You know, I mean, you're trying to, because it takes another six months to build the house, so you're trying to decide what the market will need a year from now. So it's just really, really critical um, if it could be made a priority to make that time faster. That would be awesome. Okay, and so two things that are going against the city of Missoula. Uh, number one, first and foremost, is the uh, state mandated rezoning. So rezoning is a big part of how uh, the developers figure out what they're going to be building in certain areas of the city of Missoula, city planning, all that kind of stuff. And another thing was the fact that, um, you know, just the demand has been so much higher to build in the city of Missoula, which re resulted in more applications, which means they have to do more work with processing it. And so the people who are in place, in many ways, it kind of does feel as though that uh, the city of Missoula does need to restructure their uh, uh, permitting uh, rates and how they do it and be, basically be able to kind of restructure and potentially even increase the fees even more if that is the case for developers, if they want to uh, improve their services for developers moving forward. And that was something they actually spoke about last year in which they increased the fees based on that uh, I, I, uh, you know, idea of, you know, they need to... Uh, more services to provide, and a lot of developers at that particular meeting, uh, though I don't know which one's particular, but I think it was WGA, uh, that development group uh, that does a lot of the construction is also with the group that does, I'm, I'm kind of going, I'm giving a little too much context to the background, but a lot of them were in support of being able to improve the process by willing to pay a little bit more extra for uh, better services. And that's kind of what it kind of comes down to is that once you have a department that gets too big, it's about time for it to kind of grow in a, in a way. So. What it seems to me, per media department, is understaffed and underfunded, which has resulted in this slowdown of the process. So Bob Campbell, uh, city council, spoke about inflation, um, and this is what he had to say about that. That's kind of a double-edged sword as I see it. Um, we look at the cost of housing, the cost of building materials, so forth for developers, uh, particularly in recent history, has really driven up the price of housing, and that's a concern of mine. I think 
affordability of housing is a concern of constituents of mine. Um, that's why I'm here to represent. Um, I also look at interest rates uh, as they affect uh, both people buying homes, but also developers, um, you know, purchasing land, purchasing materials, and the holding costs associated with that, and the amount of time it takes to get building permits, and they have to have those holding costs at those higher interest rates nowadays. Um, those are costs that gets passed on to uh, potential home buyers. Yep, and that's a good point right there. You know, you want to increase the fees and all that kind of stuff and make it easier for those for growth to happen. Uh, you have to also take into account the costs of living with moving forward. So even if we do potentially increase the fees to be able to um, fast track a lot of the permitting process, that won't necessarily make the prices even better for a lot of the developers who wish to potentially create the affordable housing that the Missoula has been um, seeking for quite some time now since the end of the pandemic. So uh, we're actually going to move on. We're going to check out a little bit about, uh, this is actually more about uh, the process in which, hey, if you have a venue, if you have a venue in the state of Montana, you're basically allowed to uh, partition and allow for the use of wine and beer. Uh, no liquor because liquor licenses are expensive and they uh, fall under different guidelines, but the state of Montana allows for a tavern uh, 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 tavern code kind of deal. So it's essentially what they're planning on doing. And so they're trying to look for a new tavern zoning to approve for the 1200 Shakespeare Street. If you know this address, it is uh, essentially where Westside Theater is. And so Kelly Boma from Westside Theater talks a little bit more about this uh, tavern a request for the city through the state. License we are applying for is through the state and it's a nonprofit uh, arts venue beer and wine license. And I just wanted to say this for the public as well. Um, this is a license that um, the MAM has, the Roxy, the ZAC. Um, so we're kind of falling in line with our fellow arts organizations. And the revenue stream that comes from serving alcohol from our own license helps us significantly with the other programs that we provide for the arts and greater community of Missoula. Um, and, and for the most part, one of the things they also wanted to mention too is that with the tavern um, uh, license and everything like that, they're usually you're not supposed to serve uh, alcohol, beer, wine for this particular tavern thing after a certain time. And for Westside Theater, they usually, uh, the last time they serve any kind of alcohol is usually during intermission, which usually takes place sometime around 8 o'clock, if not a little bit earlier. So there's some information about that as well. And so that was just a little bit of history. Like, if you're a nonprofit organization and, you know, like this is something that even free cyclists can look into as well for like a tavern kind of deal to be able to sell and, you know, when they do their events there as well. So that's something that uh, Bob would definitely uh, get a benefit from. So I'll, I'll, I'll contact Bob for that one. Um, so, Bob Campbell, at the end of the meeting, uh, spoke about an officer, Jerry Alden, uh, Odlin, who uh, came up with him during their uh, rookie and their uh, probationary officers back in 2000. Last week, he lost his battle with uh, cancer. Uh, he got uh, diagnosed with stage four lung cancer, and uh, Bob Campbell is uh, basically talking a little bit more about him um, to honor his uh, lost friend. My condolences go out to uh, his family, his wife Sherry, um, children, uh, his brother Chris, Odlin, who is also a police officer in the department. He retired a, a detective, or excuse me, a, a captain a number of years ago. Um, condolences as well, of course, the Missoula Police Department as a whole. I mean, it's, it's a huge loss for them. Uh, it's going to take some time to work through this, I know. Um, but I, I, I take some comfort in the fact that, you know, particularly a case of, you know, his wife, Sherry, and, and the police department, you know, police department's a family. And I know firsthand from my personal experience, that family is going to be there for Sherry, for the family going forward. And um, it, it just, you know, that, that's one of the great things about that law enforcement family that, that was there. Uh, was there for me in my time of need. I know it's going to be there for um, the Odlin family as well. So, um, Godspeed, um, Jerry. And um, I'm not saying I'm going to I, I miss you. All right, let's move on. Uh, we're going to jump right into your committee meetings. Uh, I wanted to uh, mention that uh, 
Committee of the Whole, they spoke about drafting a resolution for an immediate ceasefire in the Israel-Hamas war. And so far, Christian Jordan talks a little bit more of the background and the reasoning behind this, uh, uh, basically, resolution that she wants to pass. It is really okay for municipalities to weigh in on matters of of human where there's a humanitarian crisis for which we have no way to influence it just as a matter of saying that as a city we stand together to support these victims um, and the wording of the original resolution was a little more pointed than this one is uh, because of some of the language I think people were worried that it does mean that we're taking a, a, a more specific stance on on this issue but um, yeah, just as a summary, as an elected official, people who voted for me, this was important to them. And All right, and so that uh, was some of the reasoning behind this uh, resolution. We also have a uh, public comment from Brendan Work. Um, he is with the organization Montana for Palestine, and he spoke a little bit more on this topic. So we're forced as Missoulians to hope that largely symbolic measures such as this one uh, we'll put pressure on those representatives, particularly because one of them is the chairman of the Senate Subcommittee on uh, Defense Appropriations, who can, according to Israel's top generals, stop the killing almost single-handedly. Um, now, of course, even if this resolution fails to do that, I believe it would succeed in sending two strong messages. First, that Missoula as a city is innocent of our federal government's actions and does not endorse, nor do we as Missoulians, the continuing slaughter of over 25,000 Palestinians and 1,000 Israelis. And second, that Missoula is part of a larger world of people demanding peace and justice in the region. As I'm sure you've noticed in your lifetimes, as I have in mine, uh, Missoula has become a much more global city than it used to be. Twelve years ago, all of my students were born in the United States. This year, I have Syrians, Egyptians, Tajiks, Afghans, and Koreans. Um, I don't think the city needs to take positions on those countries, or indeed on Palestine. But in my opinion, it is time that we affirm Missoula is a city that is part of the world, can take decisions regarding global affairs. All right, so that was uh, Brendan Work talking a little bit more about some of the background and some of the reasoning behind this resolution. Mike Nugent, City Council, made a resolution to table this discussion because this resolution would have gone to directly to uh, City Council for Monday. Um, that was voted down, and then Mike Nugent talks a little bit more about why he wanted to table this uh, specifically just because uh, it's definitely too big for little Missoula to kind of handle. I've indicated, and there's a lot of people who who have stances that are guided by expertise that support every angle of this um and so i wish we could take more time and i would like to take more time because it, frankly the the idea of council weighing in on on matters on the world stage should be something that we give more than 20 minutes to and it should be something that is that's a conversation where we have you know people who are experts in the field come and be part of that conversation if we're going to take the time to weigh in on something like that it shouldn't simply be um, anecdotal opinions from from some of us reading things uh, you know a passionate uh, individual on one side of the issue i mean we should be opening that up so i i support peace and and i helped craft this to get where it is today and i have no problem with it but i think that this is not nearly enough time to discuss something like this. That All right. And so that was uh, Mike Nugent's uh, response to this uh, particular topic. Um, nothing changed on this item. We'll live on for, to further discussion. And, and, and also, I just wanted to mention this in terms of news um, happening out of the whole uh, Gaza Israeli thing was uh, coming out of South Africa. The uh, ICJ, the International Courts, uh, requested that Israel provide humanitarian aid and must prove without a reasonable doubt that their actions in Gaza has not reflected in the accusations that have been formalized in their vote which overwhelmingly supports the Palestinian people as they are inching closer to genocidal actions on the part of Israel. Uh, they read many of the quotes from top official Israel official force over the course of the 100 plus days this war has been ongoing and so far ICJ fell short of outright asking for a ceasefire and gave about a month to uh, for the IDF to improve their approach and provide humanitarian aid as uh, ASAP, essentially, and so it's a, definitely a big blow to the inter, in the international community against Israel. But at the same time, it hasn't uh, outright asked for a ceasefire on that end. So, 
that's kind of like what it's kind of up in the air. There's going to be a lot of information coming out over this morning as well because literally the South Africa ICJ announced this just this morning. They had like a whole uh, live stream to Associated Press around 3.30 a.m. this morning. So I got a chance to get a little taste of what they were talking about while I was having breakfast. So we're going to move on to uh, climate conservation and parks. And yet again, they're going to be talking about the development of the... Um, uh, the Clark Fork River from Madison to Cares Park with the idea of uh, restoration slash mitigation projects to help uh, improve the uh, in investing around the area to uh, mitigate erosion or along the banks of the Clark Fork River. Nathan McLeod, Parks and Rec, talks about the qualifications of this development and Morgan Valiant a little bit more with the open space approach for this. With a uh, design consultant team, that's Respec is the company, went through a, a full RFQ, RFP process to get someone who's qualified to do this. They have provided their recommendations and their design as to how to design these. Um, they've done this all over the state, all over the country, and so we're kind of following the recommendations of that consultant team as to what the best practices are for making sure that we're creating something that's gonna be stable for all sorts of different high water events. Um, and then, uh, Morgan, do you want to jump on and answer any more of that? Yeah, thanks, Nathan. Um, I think it is worth knowing that this this team that we're working with, um, you know, we've been working with them now for three years. They um, do include engineers that actually built uh, Brennan's Wave and the access point in Karis Park. And so we we've got folks that have, you know, decades of engineering experience within this reach. Um, we also are going to have to get um, both uh, state, local, and federal permits for this work, um, and especially for, you know, um, specific to, to Keras, which is a larger access point in both scope and scale and also engineering. Um, you know, part of getting those permits is, you know, our permitting agencies certainly consider this kind of stuff, and I know this bleeds into one of your other um, questions mr campbell but the um you know u.s army corps of engineers specifically because the Keras access is going to be built on an army corps of engineers certified levy uh, it will be going through additional engineering review as part of our permitting process all right so there's a lot of uh, uh, uh tape they have to get through before they get the final uh go ahead at uh, improving the area not to mention creating ada accessibility through Karis Park to the Brennan's Wave and beyond. So it's gonna definitely be a major improvement as that. And he did mention Mr. Campbell, Bob Candle, the city council was concerned about the best laid plans. And so far the folks on the project have uh, double dipping into restoration and mitigation in further use in the form of access points throughout various banks from Madison to Karis Park, where main access points for folks who fall under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, the Karis Park in, in embankment is a phased project which kind of started with the bear track bridge improving thing got rid of the giant hill that was there i do miss it personally that's just my own personal opinion on that one but um morgan talks a little bit more about the open space bond and uh gets further into some of the details in terms of how this came to be i think the open space bond funding side of things you know this really doesn't fall within uh, the purview of the county open space bond the county open space bond also um they just they determined that they were just going to use that money, their $7.5 million for land acquisition, not for capital improvement projects. So there's a fundamental difference in how that money could be spent at the county level. But it is worth recognizing that river access through this um, reach and reaches a upstream of town and downstream of town is a larger community collaboration and effort and we are working with every partner you can imagine to make sure that we're doing right by the river and providing good uh, recreational opportunities all right and so uh one of the things that i also want to mention some just some factual things that they even brought up uh, the last time i spoke about this is that during the peak summer uh, days in which they have floaters rafters and all the things coming through the clark Fork river on a peak day you would see 2,000 people individuals uh, that float down the river um, and that's uh, equivalent of basically 50 people per hour that's just floating down the river and they're just worried about some of the erosion that happens when people find their own um, um, makeshift access point to the river whether they're just kind of walking up from the bank and beyond 
or just simply waiting to go near uh, certain areas which already have like a, a naturally formed beach. So it's it's definitely interesting how but they're going to move forward with this. But this is something that's been on um, Morgan Valley and, and many of the folks mind for over 10 years in terms of river restoration, first and foremost, but with an emphasis on be, basically being able to create an infrastructure that would last uh, for quite some time with some input from the Army Corps of Engineers as they were speaking, uh, because this is not only a uh, local issue and since it pertains to rivers it also is a federal issue as well it's interesting about how like how like properties work and everything like that and how rivers even if they run adjacent to private property the rivers are federally protected and they cannot necessarily be owned by certain kind of uh things so it's definitely interesting how uh, a lot of people are going to have their uh, hand on this project moving forward so uh, that's it for basically your city council meeting um, you can find out more information by going to the cities of Missoula's website ca.missoula.mt.us uh, again um, the another website which is a perfect website for those looking to get some basic um, information is um, uh, engagemissoula.com and engagemissoula.com is a wonderful web website where you can actually um, interact and have a Q&A with the uh, people who are working on these projects. Um, it is uh, something that the city of Missoula uh, has been trying to push to get some input from the community about certain uh, current, upcoming, and also projects that are in the works, uh, So, uh, which also includes upcoming. So without further ado, here are a bunch of new programs that are going to be airing on MCAT, including a promo for our summer, our actually a spring break camp that is happening March 18th. I have defeated the enemies of nature. I have come here to serve you. The locomotive we have was originally the number three locomotive. We know it as the number seven because that was what was changed once it was purchased by the Anaconda Copper Mining Company. So then you have the Anaconda Copper Mining Company, which in 1928, uh, Western Lumber was sold to the Anaconda Copper Mining Company. Uh, and the engine became the seventh engine in Anaconda's fleet, so they renamed it the number seven. Uh, it was primarily used for hauling logs. It would haul logs from the camps out to a landing, and then at the landing, the logs would be unloaded onto flat cars and then brought into the mill from there. Hollywood comes calling. They've got this great idea. They want to make this movie about kind of warring logging camps. Uh, so they decide they're going to bring it out. Uh, they're going to film them in the woods of western Montana. The Bonner Mill here was one of the filming sites. It was filmed on location here, uh, all over western Montana, even up to Glacier National Park. In fact, some people are arguing that maybe they actually belong to our same species. But in any case, a bunch of wily folks started heading across into what's called the Mammoth Steppe, which was this wonderful hunting, hunting environment with big game. And they walk across all the way into North America. Now, at the time of the Ice Age, this was called the Bering Strait, and because these continental glaciers had locked up so much ice, it was open landscape, and people hunted across it. They didn't have, you know, we're not going to North America. They didn't know where they were going, except they were following game animals and hunting, and when um, places would be depleted, um, they would move on. And they would say, well, you guys are so primitive, you don't even use the wheel. You know, well, we didn't have to because we had birch bark canoes, which were this engineering marvel, marvel to this day, you know, and, and we didn't need the wheel until we moved out onto the plains. And that's where the Red River cart was developed. So as we, yeah, as the buffalo are moving farther and farther west and we have farther and farther to go and we don't have river systems anymore, that's when the Red River cart, that's when the wheel starts getting used on the northern plains. When, when it becomes useful, basically. Totally. When it becomes absolutely necessary, you know. Then, well, and, and you were just mentioning the voyageurs. 
so and you were saying that that you know the voyageurs were were kind of a different story well they they were the people the the first french who came to the continent in you know the first french settlers in the early 1600s like a year before jamestown i think the french landed their first colony in 1606 and i think jamestown was 1607. it makes me wonder what are each and every one of you capable of living as brothers doesn't have to mean solving mass systemic issues. One of the most powerful tools we have is our voice, and more so, our actions. If you're old enough, you can vote. If you're not, you can still contact and reach out to representatives, because they make the change in our legislative bodies. If we convene here today to appreciate and applaud his work, then we are the kind of people who can be change makers ourselves. Being here today shows that you are ready to do the work. But with the help of all the amazing teachers I had and endless support that was given to me, I made it through all of high school. I will forever appreciate Willard for the community I got to be a part of and watch grow through the years. And thank you to Cameron for always, always pushing me to be better. I'd also like to thank Ryan for giving me advice every morning. Thanks to Carolyn for always checking on me. Gwen for supporting my art always, and thanks to all the teachers that have helped me. Willard is now a special place to me, and I'm so grateful for all the time I got to spend here. Uh, yes, it's always important to promote some of the uh, local programs that are uh, uh, being recorded and aired through MCAT. You can find out more information by logging on to MCAT.org, like you saw right there in the last promo. Uh, we also have our channels on 189 and 190 through Charter Spectrum, so I suggest you guys check out that. Uh, before I jump into your pre-critic, where I uh, pre-judge a movie whether they need it or not, I'm going to be uh, pre-judging the weather as it looks like it's getting warmer and warmer with a uh, Monday forecast of essentially uh, nearly 50 degree temperatures in the city of Missoula. We're like in the dead of winter, usually end of January, early February, just in time for Valentine's Day, probably we will one of the colder days of the year <laughs> for many reasons or uh, no reasons whatsoever. I don't know what I'm talking about. But anyways, uh, yeah, the weather's, uh, we had a cold spell, it literally kind of feels like a, a summer in the winter time. Uh, for most of us who have uh, endured some of the really cold temperatures. I've had some people that I've known who there's pipes burst and everything like that. But uh, Monday, they said the high is going to be uh, 49 degrees and, there's, and it's going to be sunny too. So it's going to be interesting uh, as we get past this weekend as the low won't actually even dip into the 20s until I would, uh, from what my weather app told me, it was like about a week uh, probably after the uh, warm day on Monday. So who knows? Oh, we might even have that warmer day on Sunday. I always know that uh, when I look at the weather forecast, it's like when I look at the days and there's like a couple days ahead, I was like, okay, I have to minus a day a lot of times because it always feels like the weather uh, is a little bit faster uh, when it comes to the forecast. So anyways, let's jump right into movies that are coming out this weekend. And why not start off with a Bollywood ripoff of the movie Top Gun, uh, which basically is a, yeah, it's exactly what you think it is. It uh, has everything that you need from a Bollywood movie. Uh, uh, steaks, uh, plenty of things. Uh, life is like a box of uh, Golgapa. You never know what Indian remake of Hollywood blockbuster you're going to rip off. Uh, this is just Top Gun, but pr produced by the Bollywood. Honestly, it's a pleasure to be culturally appropriated beyond selling uh, other countries fast food for once. And this one follows a ragtag group of jet fighters fighting their enemy and falling in love along the way. Yeah, Top Gun really doesn't have much of a plot if you really think about it. All right, moving on. We have Miller's Girl. I think I uh, also did a pre-critic of this, but I guess they might have just rebranded it and uh, just decided to re-release it, or maybe they released it in indie circuits and now it's finally released in major streams. But this is essentially where uh, a professor who gets preyed upon by their students because the opposite almost never happens. Professors, please, come on, forget about it. But if you like these kind of films where girls who prey on their professors get work of fiction called Miller's Girl. This movie tells a tale that all college professors are victims of their sexual peaking young students. If you want to create a, a population of young girls hooking up with their professors, then 
this is the movie for you. Uh, American Star, welcome to the world of professional assassins. Ooh, this movie will likely uh, follow the uh, tropes of a good-hearted assassin getting in way over his head to fight the very force that employed him. Much likely, most likely, uh, that will be said in the sequel as this movie follows the guy's one last hit only to get in way over his head and fight against forces beyond his control, but still skilled enough to pull one over on the big bosses that hired him and now are against him. Uh, this next movie is, um, uh, it's, it's called Sometimes I Think About Dying. This is one of those films that will, would not get well promoted online because of the ban on the unaliving term and because of the internet will gaslight you into living for purposes of selling you online therapy. So basically it is a simple drama about a girl who has given up on love and life as she meets a new love interest that will solve all her problems. The end. No, uh, I believe this drama Oscar bait film was meant to teach people about self-love over the burdens of some of us pose on our partners as we become more selfish and lazy. Can't wait for the next product to buy. All right, so those are the movies that are coming out for your weekend and more. Up next, we have a redub movie from the 1936 movie, Sweeney Todd. I believe I've done this before, but I'm bringing it back for a redub for you guys today. Okay, make sure there's plenty of poofs on my white dress. I wanna look like the Michelin Man, okay? Don't you wanna show a little skin at least? It's not inappropriate, but something that's tasteful. <clears throat> Let me educate you on high society. Oh, I love being talked down to. At least you can buy some napkins. I'm cleaning with Kleenex. No. Oh, I didn't know that rich men only had imagination. The more you hide, the more the imagination, darling. If you can remember that, you can find yourself a rich, uh, middle class, up lower middle class husband. Uh, shut up. Sir, if we don't solve the climate change problem, we won't be able to save the snails. And done. I just solved all the problems by ignoring them. Come on now. Bless you, sir. You never cease to amaze me. All right, and another thing. Make sure you don't pay the workers for a third week straight and get the uh, strike busters up in arms, okay? I'm trying to inflate the company's value. Well, you've inspired me to get myself a husband. I'm going to go get one uh, by going to the uh, mechanic shop and being like, hey, I need some... Police on the payroll, all sorts of kind of things that can help you. And when the dust settles, you'll be able to sell it out at quite a profit. Oh, and the less people know about this, the better. Well, well, well. Hello, everyone. I was listening the whole time. Congratulations on <laughs> well, upselling you. your market. Oh, this is my bookkeeper. Some might call them a bookie. Oh, no, nice this is my to friend. Meet you. He's been my friend since my father's horse kicked him in the head. Oh, would you like to get 1930s drunk? Anything to feel. Oh, so uh, this one was made through fermented tea. Someone told me it doesn't have alcohol in it, and I'm like, okay. They call it kombucha. <laughs> I just thought it was kind of funny. Yeah, I heard it was a status drink. Mm, father, father, father. Oh, where are my manners? This is my daughter, uh, Freya. She, uh... Nice to meet uh, you. So this is your daughter? You look lovely. I'm only his daughter through blood. Oh, yeah, she likes saying that. She also likes calling me by my first name. It's very disrespectful. Alarm, alarm. Would you like to snooze for five minutes? Well, shall we get this thing over with? Don't come back without an engagement ring. <laughs> All right, welcome back. We're going to talk about some events that are happening inside the city of Missoula. If you're interested in going out and about, there are all sorts of things happening in the uh, Missoula area as it is downtown down uh, downtown dine local week January 22nd through the 20th this event helps promote local businesses and encourage people to get out there and eat some of that locally uh, eatery places Missoula downtown partnership in conjunction with many local downtown eateries is part of this uh, project that will end on Sunday so uh, get out there and eat out if you want to it's up to you who cares uh, civilian response to active shooter events. Uh, this class is taught by local law enforcement and is going to be hosted at the Lifelong, Learn Le Lifelong Learning Center uh, this morning at 9.30 a.m. and is designed for businesses and community members to take proactive approaches to their safety in the event of an active shooting or violent intrusion. The civilian response to, uh, to active shooter events, CRACE, uh, course was designed to build on the avoid, defend, uh, deny strategy developed by advanced law enforcement rapid response training alert in 2004 Crace provides the uh, strategies guidance and the proven plan for surviving an active attack event talkers include the history and prevalence of 
active attack event, civilian response numbers, um, medical issues, and uh, considerations for conducting drills. It is zero dollars to attend and is hosted at the Life Learns Learning Center. Uh, it's right next to the Sovereign Hope Church off of Third Street. You just take that one street uh, that way. So it is uh, educational and it is a way for you if you are very concerned about these kind of things as they have been coming to kind of fruition um, in many places and um, a lot of uh, swatting calls in Missoula has been pretty uh, on the rise in terms of a lot of uh, schools being uh, uh, on lockdown for various reasons over the last uh, month or so. So it's been it's been pretty interesting. I'll talk a little bit more about that news item as I move forward. But uh, if you're interested in doing some indoor fun, you know, staying indoors, staying warm, but also being active, Mismo Gymnastics, Root Tucker Sports Center, YMCA are among the three places you can go to have some indoor fun while also uh, staying active. Um, Missoula Food Bank meal distribution, uh, it happens uh, Monday, Tuesdays, Thursdays from 10 a.m. to uh, 7 p.m., uh, Wednesdays and Fridays from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Emergency food services at MFB and CC are available for anyone and everyone, and getting food is free, simple, and convenient. So please wear a mask and come through the front doors of our food bank, 1720 Wyoming Street, during the food bank distribution hours. Uh, I don't know about the whole uh, wear a mask thing, but I'm pretty sure it was copy and pasted since uh, the early 2020s. So. Uh, Tiny Tales and Story Time at the Missoula Public Library. It is a great way for kids to get in, uh, engaged with reading here at the Missoula Public Library, which highly encourages literacy amongst youth. And that happens uh, uh, at 1030 every Friday on the second floor of the Missoula Public Library. Uh, Radius Gallery is doing an, exhibiting, uh, an exhibit that's opening today. Uh, it's called Tell Me a Story, starting at 11 a.m. Each of these artists creates vivid, active scenes, imagined narratives, and that are turned uh, serene, mysterious, and uh, um, and very compelling, essentially. So they engage in our imagination, inviting us to enter the extent of the stories they've begun. This title is a story drawn from the 1969 poem, Tell Me a Story, by Robert Penn Warren. And they can join for the opening reception from uh, uh, tonight from 5 to 7 p.m. Everyone is welcome. And so they'll have the installation uh, installed at 11 today and open for anyone to view but then they'll have the event for people to enjoy and meet up and greet um, from five to seven. Yarns and Watercolor, 12 noon. This is a uh, ongoing event that happens on the fourth floor of the Missoula Public Library. Youth Writers Group, this is on the second floor of the Missoula Public Library. If you are a writer or you have a kid that's an inspiring writer, they have Young Adult Writers Group starting at 3.30 p.m. every Friday on the second floor. Dinner services at the Provo Roller Center starting at 5 p.m. They also have a lunch. And so 5.30 for those wanting to grab to go. So, you know, they do not turn anyone away. Some people have uh, have an out at some of these facilities. And so they do provide services for folks that are not allowed to stay at the facility, but that doesn't mean they're not allowed to grab food to go from the facilities. And even if they can't go to those facilities to grab food, there's always the food bank to refer them to as well. Uh, most of the people who are listening to this uh, uh, would not be able, would not know that the people who would need these kind of services don't have access to this information as well. So if you see somebody uh, say something about this as well for uh, further, just it's not about what you do to help people, but maybe providing them with the means to how to help themselves. So think about it like that. And, you know, it's just information. It's, it's free. Uh, Andrea Herschel is going to be playing at uh, Imagination Brewing Company starting at 6 p.m. Darren Wade uh, uh, is playing country music at Cranky Sam Public House starting at 7 p.m. Uh, Missoula Public Library is hosting an, uh, hi four history buffs, and they're talking about ponies and passes with Bruce. Uh, uh, so th this is, happens basically as last, last Friday of every month from 7 to 9 p.m. Guest speakers for lively, entertaining presentation of historic interests. This program is focused on cores of discoveries drained through Missoula and Bitterroot Valleys. This dangerous section of the trail was all about horse travel and dependence on indigenous assistance. Although the Corps was this uh, re was only a region for only a few short weeks, critical action strategies here uh, shaped the final outcome of the expedition, ch changing the face of Montana, the nation, and the people forever. So, um, yeah, Missoula is important, I guess. <laughs> just kidding. I'm just messing with it. But uh, the biggest rave in U.S. history, Amer American Legion is hosting a rave at 7 p.m. If you're interested in that kind of stuff. Uh, uh, Bases presents Neon Live. Uh, Monk's Electronic Music is going to be playing at 9 p.m. tonight. Uh, Russ Nassin of the Revelators is playing uh, some jam music at the Union Club at 9 p.m. 
Southgate Mall is going to be doing a winter market on Saturday morning as we jump into your Saturday events. Um, this is an ongoing thing that happens every Saturday to supplement your farmer's market needs. Biochar charcoal making workshop, and this is Bad Goat Forest products for the interactive workshop where you can learn to create your own biochar charcoal. This final product can be used for many purposes, whether you add it to your garden to uh, neutralize acidity, improve water uh, retention, or throw it on the forge for blacksmithing. They'll transform old boards into this useful carbon-rich material, and this is at uh, Bad Goat Forest uh, Products. I've never actually heard of them before, and it's worth checking out if you're interested in making your own charcoal. Um, introduction to beekeeping classes, Missoula Public Library on Saturday starting at 10 a.m. This is a 10 to 2 p.m. class. This is introduction into beekeeping. If you're interested in beekeeping, Missoula Public Library place is the place to be, and it starts at 10 a.m. on Saturday. Uh, a musical quest at the Missoula Public Library also is happening for, let's say you're going to learn about um, um, bees and stuff. The Missoula Symphony is doing a musical quest with symphony musicians as your guide participants. Take a magical journey through the music um, instruments um, featuring a lot of the music from um, Harry Potter. So it's going to be very interesting. This free program begins in the Imaginarium where music director Julia Tai will be conductor for the journey, free and open to the public. And they'll also be playing their symphony performance in the annual family concert at the Denison Theater at 3 p.m. on Saturday. So uh, back to uh, other things that are happening. Fort Missoula is doing a Mullen Trail District Cub Scout uh, Klondike Derby starting at 10 a.m. at the Fort Missoula. Muse museum tour at the Missoula Art Museum at 10, 11 a.m. every Saturday. Uh, Travelers, Travelers Rest State Park, uh, as soon as January hits, they're going to do a couple weeks of this kind of stuff, and so they're going to be featuring Deborah Megpie Erling. It's going to be featured at the Storytown at Travelers, Travelers Rest. MCAT will also film this event for future production, and so we'll probably be showing that during my promo segment where you see a bunch of the uh, local programs that MCAT has filmed. And as always, MCAT Saturday drop ins every single Saturday starting at 1 p.m. It is a great activity for a lot of kids who are trying to learn to make uh, stop motion movies and for with an emphasis on basically creating a movie out of inanimate objects. So it's a great introduction for a lot of kids who want to get involved uh, but are kind of weary about the technology. And so this is a great introduction for a lot of kids in um, making movies. Um, Saturday Kids Activities, Montana Natural History Center is they're going to be exploring the animals of winter starting at 1 p.m. Um, so you have a choice between MCAT and uh, the Saturday activities at the uh, Montana Natural History Center. So uh, choose wisely. All right, moving on. Singer songwriter showcase at Imagination Brewing Company starting at 6 p.m. on a Saturday. Um, John Floridas is going to be at the Old Post playing some acoustic music at 7 p.m. on Saturday. Caught in a Jam is going to be at the VFW Post 209. Uh, it's going to be a jam band starting at 7 p.m. Comedian Jordan Jensen at the Badlander at 7.30 p.m. You don't see too many shows at the Badlander. Always worth a, a, a nice peek in. Dueling Pianos at the Josh Farmer and Kyle Curtis at Stave and Hoop Speakeasy. Um, sound, uh, karaoke at Westside Lanes. Rendezvous is going to be at Monks playing some electronic music. Uh, Union Club is playing a jam band called Jackson Holt. Uh, DJ Chris Moon is every Saturday at the Badlander. Um, and that pretty much wraps up that. They, and also Sunday, I wanted to um, talk a little bit more about this because they're doing a, uh, at the Senior Center is the Five Valley Accordion Jam and Dance. So if you like accordion music, this is the place to be. And it starts at 1 p.m. at the Missoula Senior Center, which they have daily lunches starting at 11.30 a.m. Monday through Friday. Uh, very funny uh, weekly comedy open mic. If you are a comedian or aspiring comedian, they have open mics every Sunday at 8 p.m. at the VFW, in which they'll be also doing various other things um, on Saturday night with their jazz, uh, with their jam band caught in a jam uh, for an open jam for musicians at Post 209, which is downtown Missoula, right next to Big Pizza. All right, so that's a pretty heavily promoted uh, um, VFW. I don't know if there's any anything much about the news I want to talk about. Although I did want to mention um, that one missing gal who's been missing since uh, December 20th. Let me go find my notes about this. Um, Sorry about that. Eva Mason uh, Prather went missing December 30th somewhere in the Rose Park area now. Searches as far as billings in the form of billboards across the state, in which a lot of organizations and companies have uh, leased out their uh, billboards for free uh, to uh, help expand the search. It was a very out of the blue moment when the mother of two just left her home uh, without a wallet and keys along with her family convinced that she was not dressed for the weather. And this is before the cold spell that happened. Eva is a 43-year-old white woman who is five foot four talls and wears uh, uh, tall and weighs 125 pounds she has blue eyes brown hair the information you you in, in, to inv assist the investigation 
call the Missoula Police Department, 552-6300. Again, that's 552-6300 with the area code 406, of course. And the uh, reference code for the number of the uh, cases, 2023-56-230. Again, that's 2023-56-230 for their reference in terms of this case. Um, and then, you know, uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. There's, I don't know if I want to talk too much about the, uh, the news that's happening because I'm kind of wrapping up and I'm strapped for time. Uh, duh, duh, duh. Yeah, I wish I would have talked a little bit more about this, but uh, yeah, there's a lot of interesting stuff as well. There was a highlighted piece about uh, glass recycling in the city of Missoula that I wanted to kind of get into. Uh, Missoula Current reported on this a little bit more about how uh, the city of Missoula are very lax in any kind of, uh, of recycling in terms of glass. But of course, since 2018, the city of Missoula has the opportunity to recycle glass through Recycle Works, which uh, unfortunately they don't actually recycle the glass. They actually take the glass and they bring it down the Salt Lake City for recycling. Um, the state of Montana doesn't have any kind of major recycling refinery to be able to do these kind of infrastructure, kind of, oh, not infrastructure, but be able to recycle a lot of these kind of materials. Um, we do have recycle for uh, cardboard and steel, all that kind of stuff through Pacific, but they stopped doing glass many, 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 many years ago. Um, and yeah, for the most part, transportation costs are one of the reasons why uh, glass was just kind of deemed as just pointless to recycle at that point. So that's one of the things, and they talk a little bit more about this as well. Um, I did, uh, did want to talk a little bit more about the concept of swatting. Um, I do a little bit more time as I was mentioning that they're doing a class at the Lifelong Learning Center. They do a lot of classes. This is a free class the police department is putting on. And you know, it's one of the things what to do in an active shooter event. But nowadays, it kind of feels as though there's a lot of uh, swatting calls, and the swatting calls have tended to be uh, bomb threats or calls to schools that there's going to be a threat. And usually, it never amounts to really much of anything, but it's been uh, at a frequent level to uh, people are kind of getting tired of being uh, dealing with this kind of uh, threat, which uh, not to be believed to be credi credible. Missoula County Public Schools is working to notify staff and families of how district plans to proceed with regular school schedules and, you know, many things. It's just... This is kind of interesting for sure about how uh, people are doing this kind of stuff. Um, and it's, it definitely gets harder and harder to track a lot of these numbers, especially if you uh, have uh, various types of apps for your cell phones that uh, essentially create a new number um, with that information. And VPNs are so hard to track a lot of times, especially if you have some people with a certain level of savvy to be able to do it. So there needs to be, uh, it, yeah, there, it's definitely interesting about the, you know, with cell phones, the caller IDs and stuff like that. But I'm kind of going off on a tangent. So, uh, yeah, so that's basically what I want to talk about for my morning show. I never know how to quite end my morning show. I just kind of just uh, abruptly end it for the most part. So I wanted to thank you guys for joining me for this morning. There was definitely a lot of information to get through, um, a lot of things happening. Uh, it's going to be an interesting weekend, and I'll see you guys for your first Friday into February next week. So with, without further ado, for Wake Up Missoula, I'm Scott Ramp. Enjoy this little uh, space wave.